have several clients that were without power for seven whole days, 85 hours below freezing for us, which is highly unusual. As a builder, I can't just order a bunch of stuff in the lumberyard and put it together and hope it works anymore. All right, we are off-site. We are in Matt Reisinger's studio right Ooh. now. So Matt, thank you very much for being <laughs> yeah. with us. Totally, Corbett. From the Rockwell Studio. That's yeah. right, the Rockwell Studio in Austin, Texas. <laughs> and you're directly in the path of our tour, which is taking us through all of this disaster story that we're talking about for season three of Home Diagnosis. Okay. And so what we're focusing on is natural disasters and also building science mistakes okay. that turn into mm -hmm. horrible things that happen for people. And I think what we would love to have you talk about is Recently, in Texas, you had a giant disaster in the wintertime, yeah. and, it, and it, it was kind of like a domino effect. That, I, I, that was the thing that really, watching your videos, was like, wow, this is really interesting how it, this happens, and then that happens, and this happens. So 2021 was the uh, year of the big freeze in Austin. Some of my customers are out for uh, seven days, uh, no power, which is unheard of in America, kind of in general. Um, but we had a big grid failure, and we had uh, lots of things that came together. And so seven days, no power, and also 85 hours below freezing for us, which is highly unusual. And for the most part, builders in Texas have hardly done anything to withstand freezing in houses for pipes and that sort of thing. And so we had a lot of things that came together for some really hard times for, for people. All the houses that I built never had any frozen pipes, but I had several blown tankless water heaters when things thawed because tankless water heaters are on the outside of the building. When there's no power, they can very easily freeze. So, you know, there's like when a hurricane hits, it's terrifying when it comes in, but then when it leaves and it's like, oh, it's all better. That's when the water then starts dragging everything into the ocean. I think that's an interesting part of mm -hmm. the thaw cycle is that like, ah, it's not freezing anymore. And that's when your pipes are all going to blow. Yeah. Urgent notice. I have a sense that water is going to get shut off all over Texas, especially in Austin. A uh, hundred water main breaks around Austin last night. I think urgently you must fill your bathtub and anything that will hold water for drinking. You need something to flush your toilets with as well. So fill up whatever you've got. Uh, then couple that with some supply chain issues. You know, we're in the middle of COVID at that point. Water heaters are already hard to get because building was so big in America. Supplies were already limited. And so a lot of people went without hot water for, you know, two, three weeks potentially. And at my personal house, I had just installed a whole house standby generator that ran on natural gas like three or four months before all this went down. And my wife was like, do we really need to spend the money on that? And I was like, yeah, I really feel like it'll be good for us. Sure enough, we were out of power for almost three days at my house. Uh, and I never had any problems, including my exterior mounted uh, tankless water heater never froze because I had power to it. My in-laws came and stayed with me for a couple days because they had no power. And we were going around to neighbors' houses, helping them cap off broken water pipes until the plumber could get there. It was it was a pretty crazy time in, in Texas. So Matt, we, we built our home all electric as well. We don't have a propane <laughs> generator. Um, you have obviously some prophetic nature to yourself, <laughs> but what do you think about the seriousness um, around building readiness? Is that something that you're seeing from clients? Are you seeing builders take that seriously? Well, certainly in Texas, uh, these days people take it really seriously because they've experienced what it's like to not have power for several days. Or if not, they had a friend who was out of power for that period of time. I mean, I have, like I mentioned earlier, I have several clients that were without power for seven whole days. Uh, and it was pretty darn cold outside. You know, even with, think about little kids in a 70s built house uh, in Texas with two by four walls and terrible air tightness. When it's 20 degrees out for a week and you got no power, it's pretty dang cold in there. You're figuring out where to go. You're thinking about how to uh, space heat or fireplace or firewood. Or oven. Or oven, which, you know, can cause other issues, too. It'd be like someone cranking up their portable generator in the middle of the living room and then which dying some people from did. carbon monoxide. Or putting it in the garage and then someone accidentally closes the garage door. There was lots of stories about accidents like that. So... I think just about everybody who's building these days, new construction or remodeling, has some amount of resilience in mind and they're thinking about what they experienced a year ago. As a result, most of my clients under construction these days are putting a backup generator in, propane or natural gas, 
Uh, in my case, when I built, I actually didn't have the budget for a standby generator, but I had a thousand dollar, eight kilowatt, what they call a wheelbarrow style. I keep that in my garage. I wheel it out, I hook it up to a propane bottle or it runs on gasoline as well. And then I can flip over manually my house from grid power to my standby generator. And with that smaller unit, I can run my main HVAC system because it's a very efficient system and my house is efficient. I can run my main lighting circuit and I've got both my kitchen, fridge and freezer and my garage. Uh, we're hunters, so we have a garage freezer. I can keep all that going so I won't lose uh, any of our food during the time. Right. The refrigerator is another thing, right? Like not in a freeze because it would obviously be kept cool. But yeah, you, that's going to ruin a lot of stuff and if it goes out in the summertime. Yeah, I mean, everybody lost their food. And then, oh, by the way, most of the grocery stores lost their food. Right. right. Uh, and there, it was actually kind of hard to find food for two weeks or so in that period of time because right. everybody was, was out of stock. Right. So people were getting to know their neighbors and inviting people. It was kind of a cool time in some respects. Same was true post Hurricane Harvey. Like people really got to know and help their neighbors out. It was it was one of those I'm proud to be an American moments when we realized like when a, when a disaster happens, people roll up their sleeves and help out. It wasn't post-apocalyptic. It was more like <laughs> it was like times. It was it's like kumbaya. post-Thanksgiving. <laughs> that, that's actually an interesting contradiction that I think it, I'm seeing more and more in people commenting on our channel, and I'm sure that you get this too, but like your solution for the readiness is another machine that draws energy. And I'm hearing a lot of people say, but I want to do it like my grandparents would have done it, which is instead of having a dehumidifier, can I just have like a plaster that is a moisture buffer and it's going to automatically do all this stuff? Or can I have a fireplace, a wood burning fireplace in the middle of my house for if the power goes out and then I need heat? And it's like, that's 16th century technology mm -hmm. paired with 21st century technology. And to me, I'm always trying to talk my clients out of that stuff. hundred percent. Me too. I certainly do. And I try and talk them out of it as much as possible. Like I don't like putting fireplaces in of any sort if I can. Now, sometimes I have to, cause the client can't be talked in and it's not my money and I'm going to do everything I can to make it as efficient and work as much as possible. But like in a modern house, even if it's just built to code, it's really darn hard to get your fireplace to draw. If you have a wood burning fireplace. Mm -hmm. now, on the other hand, if you put a gas burning fireplace in, that thing is sucking energy out of your house 24 seven because it's usually a giant air leak. And when it runs, yes, you can get some heat out of it, but it's just so few times that you'd actually want that. And it looks to me, it looks so fake. I hate them. So at my house, what I did was when I, rem my house is kind of a hybrid between a new, new construction and remodel, but my old house, had an indoor wood burning fireplace. I demoed that and I, I just have recently built an outdoor fireplace on my patio, not connected to my house in any way, shape or form, freestanding. However, when I look through a big patio door from my dining room, I can see that fireplace. So if I want, I could send my kids out in July to make a fireplace. It won't affect my house. I'm not worried about a damper. I'm not worried about backdrafting. I'm not worried about bugs getting in my house. My wife's grandfather had a raccoon get in his house one time, <laughs> and he's got a funny story of him coming out in his underwear at 2 a.m. and there's a raccoon eating life cereal out of a bowl no. at his house because it came down through an open damper on his fireplace. Wow. So, I really mean, made himself just, at home. It's like, you're right, it's 1600s technology. You know, if we can build a space station with an astronaut who spent almost a year up in space, and we send our Navy seamen under the, uh, you know, the Atlantic Ocean for months at a time. Why can't we build a better house with new technology? Yeah. Absolutely. Can we go to man-made disasters? Yeah, for sure. In season three, we're flipping between natural disasters and then man-made disasters, sometimes made in the, with the best of intentions. And what are some examples that you have seen in your career where there were good intentions and it ended up going horribly wrong? or that you've learned? Misunderstanding and misapplication of both building science and building codes. I've seen a lot of failures of those over the, over the years. For instance, when I worked in Portland, Oregon in the early 2000s, uh, we were building houses to code. And at the time, code required a vapor barrier in walls. And so the cheapest vapor barrier you can find basically is a sheet of plastic, you know, poly, we would call it. So we would line our interior walls with poly and then hang sheetrock over that, and that was meeting code for vapor barrier. And inspectors were actually called out to verify your vapor barrier was in place before you could move on to the next stage of construction. 
Well, our building science wasn't great. We had some leaky buildings. Uh, we had not so great weather barriers that also uh, didn't work super well. And as a result, we built houses that were wet in a wet environment and we put them in a hermetically sealed Ziploc bag. And so when I went through the kind of early 2000s mold crisis, which at the time Tom Brokaw was talking about black mold and insurance companies were paying big payouts to homeowners who had mold problems. The builder I worked for was being sued for several houses that I was in charge of trying to get out of the lawsuits and also trying to fix the houses and then also then trying not to have more of those future lawsuits. Like how do we build differently? So it's 2001 or two when I first heard the word building science and started hearing about mold and all these lawsuits. And we were handed lawsuit after lawsuit for six months in a row uh. until we kind of figured out what we were doing wrong. And a big part of that was totally our doing. You know, we had wet houses and we had a misunderstanding of uh, building science and thermodynamics and physics and how these houses work and, dri and dry. And so as a result, I learned a ton about that and realized, gosh, I really need to pay attention as a builder. I can't just order a bunch of stuff from the lumberyard and put it together and hope it works anymore. And so for the last 20 plus years, I've been thinking about that and making sure that my houses are as resilient as possible from the perspective of a builder who has no idea what the homeowner is going to do, but just making sure that when I build it, I've built it in a way that it will not have inherent problems for the client. And honestly, the number one thing, especially when it comes to mold, is just thinking about moisture. Moisture that's from construction, moisture that's going to rain down on the building in the future, moisture that's going to that's going to migrate through the walls either from our occupants breathing or creating moisture or moisture from the outside environment and lastly subsoil moisture, right? When it floods or uh, if you have in-ground basements, how do we keep that moisture out? And that's 80% of construction defect litigation is all moisture. And any lawyer that you talk to in town will tell you that they're so busy right now, they can't take on new clients. Wow. Because there's so much litigation out there. So as a builder, my number one enemy is water in all its forms. And I need to understand how I can defend my buildings against that enemy. And so that's what I've talked about probably the most over the years on my YouTube channel. And it's funny, we forget that everybody knows what we know, right? But sometimes we need to go back to basics. And so I always go back to the number one thing you can do to build a good house is build a house that manages moisture well. Yeah. Last question. I have a client who signed uh, on the dotted line with a production builder in the middle of the country mm -hmm. and gave a check for $25,000 and then went home and said, I think I should learn more about this and found your channel and mm. found our channel. Very cool. And then binge watched a bunch of stuff. <laughs> and my first thing to him was like, you need to stop watching Night Rising and talk about his house because you are not going to have that. That's funny. Uh, and so do you think it's possible? I think what we came to is there's a bunch of different options. One of them is walk away from $25,000. Mm -hmm. And one of them is let them build the house the way that they want. And then is before you move in, we retrofit the house. Do you think that that is an option? Because production building is probably not going away. And we know that it has... Kind and of, the housing stock is is limited right now too. Yeah, yeah. yeah for so sure. is that is that an opportunity? Yes and no. I would say if the architecture is traditional and the house has overhangs, uh, then probably it can be retrofitted. But a house that's more um, uh, that's more exposed, I'm really worried about. So for instance, you know, if you look at what modern architecture looks like in Austin, Texas today. It's no overhangs. It's instead of a pitched roof, it's a single uh, shed roof, mm -hmm. or it's a shed roof with no overhangs, or it's a flat roof. You know, the more exposed our houses are, uh, the more we have to pay attention to every micro detail. And production builders used to know this and would build houses with two foot overhangs. And so maybe a two story house, the first floor windows might have some leakage because the wind would blow, but the second story windows never had any problems. Or if you build a ranch house, like my old house in Texas, that was a one-story ranch with a hip roof and a two-foot overhang, even though it was built like junk, the house had no problems when I remodeled it. There was no mold. Yes, there was air infiltration. Yes, there was high bills, but the house was fine, and I was able to relatively easily retrofit it. And the thing that you need to focus on is, of course, all the penetrations, windows, hose bibs, electrical outlets, 
Uh, and then the hard one too is air sealing between the where the house hits the foundation. That's really hard to retrofit. However, a low exposure house maybe doesn't have problems there. You're going to get some bug infestations. You just have some ants that come into your kitchen in the in the uh, summertime and you don't know where they come from. I hate those ants. Or you have cockroaches <laughs> or you have other issues. You know, think about houses 30, 40 years ago. We only built houses that were regionally appropriate. You know, a New England cottage was built in New England and adobe house that was solid, you know, adobe masonry was built in uh, the south southeast. Uh, and all houses had overhangs. We didn't have all this chemistry and chemicals and gee whiz products to keep water out of houses. Today, super modern house that may do just fine in California where it's relatively dry is being built in a, a wet or a hot or a humid environment where if you don't flash the windows perfectly, if you don't do all those other things, you're gonna have problems. And the example I always use is you know, you think about your grandfather in his raincoat and his big golf umbrella. When he was out in the rain, no problem. Maybe his ankles got wet, but everything else was fine. Take away his umbrella and give grandpa a Patagonia jacket and that's it. How perfect does that jacket need to perform to keep you dry? I mean, you've got this big spot on your face here that all that water can get into. And if there's any rip or tear, you're getting wet. And that's our houses with no overhangs. There's no umbrella anymore. Or if there is an umbrella, it's like the tiny compact totes that fits in your purse. So maybe your head's gonna be dry, but everything else is getting soaked with that umbrella and the slightest amount of wind and that water gets in. So mm -hmm. building houses that are architecturally uh, more avant-garde or interesting means that we need to be more perfect as builders. And that worries me because everybody makes mistakes. So even though I have fantastic subs and I could get whatever material I wanted to build my house. I built my house very traditionally looking with two foot overhangs everywhere. And on my first story windows that didn't have an overhang right over them, I put an awning over them <laughs> so that I wouldn't get moisture on those areas. Right. And I still flashed them correctly and thought about it. But the more we can do to, uh, to give our house some resilience to begin with, the better off we're gonna be. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for all your work on resilience and educating builders. We yes. need builders and contractors to be able to deliver better things for yeah. these homeowners that are not asking for better things. If you are not following Matt Reisinger's channel already, which you probably are if you watch the <laughs> channel, I know because I have the stats, uh, you should go and check that out. You can also go to thebuildshow.com. Um, and there's actually a whole network now. Yeah. You've got a bunch of people who are working with you, creating content. You yeah. said 10 videos a week. Yeah, we've got 10 new videos a week on that. Some website. of which are on like very narrow topics like drywall mm -hmm. and like, you know, so I think that's a very interesting. It is, it is really cool. I mean, you literally have made your own own rising tide for for some of these other voices and I just I just want to say congratulations I appreciate that it's a lot of fun and thanks yeah, yeah for sure thanks for having me on guys awesome all right if you guys have comments uh, on what was said today or questions for Matt mm -hmm. um, for our future videos when we he comes to us or when we come back to him please do post in the comments below I uh, answer those personally like and subscribe tune in next time <laughs>